Hello, everyone, and welcome to Phoenix Gaming. I'm your host, Nick Henning, and I am joined here today by a really good friend of mine, Hung. Welcome, Hung. All right. Uh, so I uh, wanted to do the Geminate, which seemed a really fascinating class. It's the only starter class that is the five-level complexity, um, and Hung has been brave enough to take on this class and his campaign, so I wanted to lean on his expertise to to guide us through um, how to play this this just kind of bananas two-in-one class. How have you been liking it? Uh, it's been very interesting. I would say that this is actually probably the hardest class I've played in all of Gloomhaven and in Frosthaven in terms of uh, the limitations. Uh, in addition to the limitations, it also has a lot of flexibility, but uh, you can definitely get stuck in some of the limitations at times, and uh, that's where it gets interesting. Also, this is the only game, or this is the only character where I've had a card and my teammates know immediately which card I'm playing because I have to look at the card to try to figure out which orientation <laughs> it is to be able to get, hit all of the right people. But we'll talk about that in a little bit. But they're like, oh, Hung is playing that card right now. <laughs> so, you know, I'm unintentionally telling people <laughs> which card I'm trying it's to a, it's play. It's a form of body but, language communication, right? They don't cover that in the rules, so you're totally good. Hey, and it's unintentional. Like, I don't want to communicate this. It's just that, like, for whatever reason, this one shape, I can never figure out what I'm supposed to hit. But anyways, yeah, so the Geminate is really interesting because you're basically playing um, two player classes uh, at the same time. You basically have a ranged mode and you have a uh, melee mode. And actually, if you want to put up the board on the screen, um, you can see that there are seven uh, ranged cards and seven melee cards. Uh, the one thing to note is that you have a ton of cards to start off with. Uh, you will start with 14 cards, but uh, when you pick your starting kit, you have to start with 7 melee and 7 range. So you can't pick like 12 ranged once you get to higher levels, or one that it has to be exactly 7 and 7. Um, some of the other things um, that are notable about the Geminate in terms of its rules are that there are some mandatory actions that require you to switch from one mode to the next. Um, and so I guess I should explain. When you're in melee mode, you can only play your melee cards. When you're in ranged mode, you can only play your ranged cards. And then there are some change abilities uh, on your cards. If you take an, um, an action uh, that has that ability, then uh, it will force you at the end of your turn to then switch from one mode to the next. Um, the other thing is that um, you have a specific hand only for what mode you're in. So if you're in ranged mode, you only have access to the ranged card in your hands. And that's notable uh, if you're going to get hit uh, because you cannot discard cards that uh, are from your other mode. So for example, let's say that you had a round where you played out all of your ranged cards and you have two ranged cards on the field uh, that you just played for this turn and you have no ranged card in hand. Uh, if you take damage and you want to cancel it, you actually have to trash two cards because the melee cards, even if you have six melee cards in your hand, quote unquote, they're not in your hand. And so you have oh. to trash cards. And so that can be that can be very challenging. And I've actually had that happen a few times where I'm like, OK, I'm going to try to play this efficiently. I want to run through my uh, ranged mode and then swap to my melee mode. But then I'm just like, oh, no, I'm in trouble <laughs> after a couple of wolves come and hit like me three times or, you know, whatever those monsters come and hit you multiple times and you're not prepared uh, with cards to discard. Yeah, that's really nasty. So the the fact, is, you, essentially, when you're in a certain mode, the other seven cards or however many are left in your hand, just they get put on the shelf. You don't even get to play with them in any way, shape or form until you switch modes again. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, wild. So on the back of the um, Gemini thing here, they kind of say that it's mostly melee ranged and then kind of a smattering of other stuff. In your experience, does that seem accurate? Yeah, it's actually really interesting because you can do pretty much anything with this class. Uh, it has a lot of flexibility, but I would say that in general, it is best at uh, just dealing damage, whether in melee or in ranged mode. And then it can do a smattering of different things. The, like the tempo of you know switching modes do you find that you are often going back and forth between melee and ranged or do you tend to like do melee for a handful of rounds then range for a handful of rounds and kind of like burn through in like two separate legs or do you do a lot of going back and forth often um we do have a few more rules and we can cover that in just a second but in terms of play um 
I will generally try to go through one mode fully and then go through another mode fully. Uh, but as I mentioned, that has its obvious drawbacks. Mm. If you <laughs> are at the end of your cycle and you don't have any cards that you can trash. Um, in particular, um, there is a card where you, you do have a rejuvenate and that allows you to basically heal. And so you can kind of go through that, pull back, heal and whatnot. Um, but I do actually want to touch on a couple of additional rules that um, we didn't cover. Um, the main thing is that uh, the Geminate also has very range-specific cards. And so when you're in ranged mode, you can only attack people at specific ranges. So let's say it's range 5, but it can only hit things within range 5 and range 4. Uh, it can't hit anything at range 2 or range 3. And so I will say that there have been n numerous situations where I have been like... I am one step away and I don't have the movement or somebody's blocking my spot. Um, and that makes it really, really annoying. And um, the last thing is that if you do a long rest, you are always allowed to swap modes. Um, and I think that that covers the main rules. But um, the specific range one uh, does actually add a significant design constraint or, I guess, gameplay constraint in terms of what you can do. and. Uh, because sometimes you do your melee and you're still next to people and you need to be like four spaces away and it's it's difficult to get four spaces away to be able to hit those attacks. It seems like you're a lot more at the whim of the uh, uh, of the enemy AI than you might be with some other classes in that way. Well, 100%. Yeah. Like, 100%. There have been some times where I'm just like, they move in, I'm just like, you moved one step too close. And then like my entire plan had been around them being at a given range, but... Um, I think it's also been challenging because I've played a lot with the Bone Shaper class and we've had a lot of minions uh, and character summons. And then so there's a lot of character summons that get in my way and it's it's very, very frustrating. That that that, that Bone Shaper, I love that guy. But yeah, they, uh, they don't play nicely with others. Uh, okay, great. So we're going to start with the melee cards here and we're going to focus first on the melee cards that allow you to swap form. So we're starting here with uh, Changeling's Boon. Let's tell me about this card. Yeah, so Changeling Boon is one that I have kept for a long time and uh, plan to keep for a while. And in particular, it's because of the top half of this card. Uh, the top half of this card has two different attacks, and you know, two attacks is always good, especially if you can add uh, poison or if you can enhance it uh, once you unlock enhancements uh, to be able to add additional damage. Uh, the bottom ability here allows you to be able to swap um, uh, from your melee into the ranged mode, but the problem with this card is, is a throwaway. Well, it's a throwaway permanent. Uh, you get a one-time bless, which is okay. It's not like that great. Uh, if you were to play it, um, I think that the bottom half is, or the second ability is the much more important aspect, which is the ability to turn any element into sun or into um, fire and that can be pretty important uh in particular if you're fighting various enemies that always generate things that could stun you or they can do additional things with their elements and so having this card is useful if you want to do that um but i think that the top ability of this card is the most important aspect so you can just like smack down a particular character um the thing to note about this character is um, and we can talk about it now, is that there's actually very little elemental generation uh, in the base kit. And uh, you start getting more elemental generation at like level four, level five. But uh, if you want elements, you basically have to use throwaway cards, and, which is never good uh, to be able to generate on one turn to throw away and then having to spend that the next turn, assuming that nothing else uses it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The three elements that are used are sun is used on both sides, both ranged and melee, and then fire is used for ranged, and then ice is used for melee. And so if you were playing this card, it'll actually um, help your ranged side by being able to generate elements for the ranged side. But I would say that I very rarely use this as the bottom ability because I think that the top ability with two different attack twos is great. Uh, pretty standard. Um, uh, initiative order, uh, I'd usually pair this up with a lower initiative card. And I think one thing that you'll see here is that the Geminate actually has a lot of low initiative, and you can oftentimes be first in your party if you'd like to. This card is dragged down. Um, this card, it's a very interesting card. This is actually not the uh, shape that I have the most problem with. Uh, so here you have a little hook. And you situation can... going here. 
Yeah, yeah. You have a scorpion <laughs> tail with drag down. Uh, this lets you swap and it lets you immobilize. Um, so to me, you know, it'd be best case if you can hit two. Or, I mean, obviously, best case if you hit three, but you'd be in pretty good shape if you hit two, in particular, if you hit the two uh, and immobilize them when they're further away from you. But oftentimes, you're not necessarily fighting melee units, and so the immobilize doesn't actually do much. Um, I'd say if I brought this card, I would typically bring it for the bottom ability. Um, so the move four jump is pretty big. Uh, the Gemini doesn't have a ton of like big, splashy moves. And then if you're able to, uh, or if you throw this card away, with the bottom ability, you can then disarm two enemies, which I think is a pretty strong ability in Frosthaven since they don't have many stuns or disarms totally. uh, in the game. Um, so that, I typically have not carried this in my kit very often uh, because I don't think that it is good enough, but if I do, it would be for the movement and then disarming a couple of big beefy enemies um, and getting in there for my team to be able to set up. That's interesting. On paper, the drag down of the drag top down. looks pretty good to me, but I guess it's just that it's too hard to to get like the right positioning for it. I've tried so many times to get the right positioning for this, and it is never in the right position. Like they're either next to each other, or you do all of these things, and I think it's okay. Um, but the thing is that you're already in melee mode if you're next to them, and you either have to start the round already next to them to be able to hit them and then run away and change into ranged mode. But oftentimes to get into the position, you have to use your bottom ability to move. But then now you are sure you immobilize them, but you're next to them and you're in ranged mode. And so now you don't have the ability to use your ranged abilities because you're too, you're too close to all of the enemies. I see. Cool. All right, let's move on to, to draining pincers. Uh, draining pincers, I think, uh, so what you'll see here is that you have a three attack, uh, with advantage to do a straight line, throw away card with a pretty bad initiative. Um, I mostly carry this for the move three jump, uh, at the bottom, and then that lets you be able to transition, uh, from the melee to the ranged form. Um, I think that there's been a few examples of being able to use the top ability, but again, getting everyone in a perfect line can be challenging. Um, and so I will only use this in kind of dire emergencies where I really need to try to hit two people. Uh, but the bottom ability is just pretty solid. Yeah, the top doesn't even seem that spicy for a lost card. So it's I can see why you'd mostly just be using it for the bottom. Yeah, and I think we had talked about this offline a little bit in the sense that because there are so many lost cards, or there's so many cards for the Geminit, that all of the lost cards are actually much worse than the lost cards from other classes. And I would very, very much agree. Like, when I think about the Spellweaver from Gloomhaven, it can do, like, way, way, way more. Or Spellweaver? What is what is the class? I think Spellweaver. Yeah, the Spellweaver class throwaway cards were just like infinitely better than yeah. this card. Like you could hit like multiple people, no restrictions in terms of range, except for anything within range three. Here it has to be exactly in a line and you do three each, which is just not very good. So do you find yourself with this class being a little bit more uh, free with using the, the throwaway cards because you have extra cards? Or is it that they're not so exciting, so it's not even really worth it to, to use it and you use them for hit points instead? Or how do you end up kind of managing the extra card bonus in the first few games i was very stingy with my cards and uh i think that i like to play a value game you know i've seen your videos you talk about you know the importance of uh you know keeping cards and not throwing them away early but uh, i noticed that when other people were exhausting i still had like six or seven cards in my hand i'm like okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe I should be uh, play a little bit more for tempo and try to like kill things. But um, I think that that actually is you bring up a point in terms of throwaway. You can actually tank pretty well um, against big enemies because you have such a huge card pool that you can use cards to throw away instead of uh, throwing away the cards for advantages. Mm -hmm. Um, now, obviously, there are certain situations where it can be really good to throw away the card, but I would say that I'm oftentimes trying to get more value and then tanking for my team in particular because uh, my party composition has been everyone needs two whole turns to set up, so I'm just <laughs> sitting there trying to do things uh, while the team is uh, summoning things, setting up their permanent cards um, and whatnot. Got it. Okay, cool. So the last of the switcher melee cards is Hornet Stingers. 
this is my MVP card. Like, yeah. this is the most important card, I think, in the entire kit. Uh, and this is also the card where I have the most troubles with trying to figure out how the formation works. So I'll just be looking at the card, going like this. <laughs> trying to figure out um and it's not it doesn't look that complex but like when you're looking at a board i'm like okay can i hit one can i hit two yeah anyways um yeah this one is just amazing uh you can basically pierce three which at the beginning of the game basically pierces everything you get to do a damage and you know the damage is incidental but the main thing is that you're able to apply poison uh on an area of attack and you can just poison everything and get through some of those sprites, which might have a lot of shields, um, has a pretty good initiative all by itself. So you can basically make sure that you get this initiative in first. And then the bottom ability is actually pretty decent too, where if you need to tank, you can just like walk in and then uh, take some shots from people. But in general, the top ability is just like absolutely amazing. So imagine playing Hornet Stingers. And then after you play Hornet Stingers, um, well, you'll be in ranged mode. But mm -hmm. in the future turns, you can go back to Changeling Boon and hit them twice for two damage each, which is effectively three now that they're poisoned. Um, yeah, Hornet Stingers is by far, I think, one of the most important cards in the entire kit. There's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And one difference between your and my uh, play style or, or play groups is that you play in a four-player group. So the odds that you're going to be able to hit more enemies in this block is higher than when I would be playing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we all always play four players in our group. And so there's always a lot of enemies to be able to hit with uh, AoE attacks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's dive into some of these other melee mode cards. Um, Actually, before we even dive into these, so we just went through four switcher cards. Do you find that you generally need all four switcher cards or do you want to kind of like keep that kind of 50-50 ratio of switcher cards or do you try to get away with, with fewer than that when you're taking your loadouts? Um, I actually don't really look at the number of switcher cards okay. when I look at my loadout, and maybe that's a maybe that's not a good thing. Um, I think I typically look at just more of the abilities, and then I kind of manage the switching ability where necessary. There's a couple of things that let you switch if like you're really in trouble. Um, I mean, obviously, I think that bringing only one switcher card is probably a bad idea. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, you want at least two to three on each side, but I would not necessarily say. I'm bringing a card just because it has a switcher. So, for example, drag down. I would not bring drag down because um, I just don't think it's good enough. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, cool. Let's take a look at Feeding Frenzy here as another lost card in the top. Yeah, Feeding Frenzy. Uh, this lets you get a one-time benefit of getting a sun, and then you, um, when you kill an enemy on your turn, you can then switch forms or ignore the switch forms. And so all of the switch forms are mandatory. This allows you to break that rule, and it allows you to be able to, um, yeah, just stay in the current form. Uh, I would find that this is actually not as good as I want it to be. Uh, I definitely tried playing it in a few of my games, but it is not consistent uh, because you might not be able to kill enemies on the turns that you want, in particular, because you don't have a lot of, like, guaranteed kills, so to speak. Um uh, I think that it can be good in certain situations. Uh, I'm thinking if you have swarms of things, whether it's those lightning eels or the piranha pigs or any anything that comes in like low hit points, then you can kill them. But if you're fighting against like a beefy wind demon or you know an earth demon, it's this card is almost useless in those situations. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. The bottom of this card yeah. just uh, me up though, with the all adjacent allies and enemies suffer damage and loot. So it's just every space around you you interact with in some way <laughs> exactly yeah yeah um and i actually didn't mention this but uh that also is a downside of hornet stingers uh so hornet stingers actually does do poison to other people right. uh if they happen to be in those squares um and you will notice that theme in some of the other ones i guess you know these bugs don't care about those stupid humans or other races and so they're just like we're just gonna hit, hit everybody um as we go that keeps the uh, bottom ability from, from gloomhaven right like they have the same kind of yeah, yeah. exactly uh bottom ability is fine um i think that there's only two loot cards in the entire um deck uh and i would typically only take this if uh there were enemies that had a lot of shields or if they had a lot of retaliation and i just really needed to poke out a few points of damage against them with feeding frenzy sure. but generally this is a card that i would not bring with me in my kit got it 
flailing, uh, tendons. flailing this is hilarious looking i love this <laughs> <laughs> it is very hilarious uh you can basically hit a lot of things uh but i think again you'll notice my theme or again maybe it's just my play style but i don't like this card very much sure uh, i think very, that the pattern is very niche the pattern is just way <laughs> too hard to hit and then you're in an awkward position and you're dealing one damage it's like who cares about one damage and you know disadvantage can be okay but you're also then potentially uh, muddling your own allies when you do this. Yeah. Uh, if you were to play this card, um, so I actually will sometimes carry this just because of the high initiative, yeah. uh, because you can basically guarantee that you have that high initiative, and then if you really want to, you can pop the bottom ability. And the bottom ability is, I think, where uh, this card's much better, where you can basically wound everyone with a two, but at the same time you have to wound all of your allies within two so that is the downside and you can generate some fire on the side um but getting that wound on high shield enemies is uh really what this one's about because there's not a lot of good ways where you can wound multiple enemies at the same time sure yeah it definitely seems more like the initiative side for that card it's not not super impressed by by the effect on there yep yep uh next card is horn beetle carapace and this is actually a very very strong card mm. um and i will almost always play this card on the first cycle of my melee um so basically you will get four ticks on the top uh and if you're doing melee you get plus one attack if you're in ranged you get plus two attacks so ideally what you do is that you set this up and you're able to swap immediately into your ranged mode and effectively this adds eight points of damage to your ranged attacks which is very very important especially if you're dealing with high hit point enemies or if you're dealing with high shield enemies if you need that extra points of damage to be able to get through shields yep and do you ever wind up playing this bottom here i mean it's a respectable amount of shield obviously you go pretty much nowhere with it but i think i've maybe used it once in my like 15 games um I think that the top is just so good uh, that it's almost always used as the top. But yeah, you know, maybe there's a few situations uh, where you just you're already in front and you pop a little bit of shields because you know your allies are going to take some time to catch up or you need to take some shots. Yeah, the top here is funny too because I just did the drifter video not too long ago and it's like, well, it's what the drifter does, but not quite as good as what the drifter does. <laughs> yeah, right on, icebound. Ice found quills. Uh, this one's a fine card. Um, the this top is ability. A loss I can get behind. <laughs> yes, this is definitely a loss I can get behind. I mean, a attack five is a very, very respectable loss card uh, for a level one card, and I would absolutely use this. Uh, and then you get a few bits of bonuses where you get an extra attack or extra. Um, Piercing, if you happen to have ice, yeah. uh, the initiative is fantastic. Again, 14. And that's actually sometimes why I don't want to use this immediately, because the initiative mm -hmm. is so good. Um, but obviously, if you can pop an enemy and get rid of them, building that tempo is very important. And the bottom ability is actually surprisingly better than I thought it would be. So if I can get up front, just do a little bit of shield and get some retaliate and use this against a swarm of enemies, um, it's definitely been used multiple times uh, throughout my campaign. Yeah. Yeah, and then you can just kind of cash it in for when you find the big hit point, shield point, bad guy that needs to die or whatever, right? I could see that. Yeah, Absolutely. This, this seems like a winner for sure. Cool. And then the last melee card, Reckless Jab. Yeah, Reckless Jab is very interesting. Um, you basically can do two points of damage, and if you want or if you don't have these conditions uh you will gain these conditions and then take some downsides and so you can basically wound someone by taking um oh sorry you can wound someone uh by disarming yourself and this can be fine if you want to set it set yourself up for like a rejuvenate turn or a heal turn or if you don't have any um poison then you can gain poison add plus two attack so it's a way to get in extra points of damage uh by taking some negative effects on yourself yeah, um you know ability... get like ping to healing or if you like you said you have a rejuvenate up that's a pretty gnarly attack a four damage disarm i mean obviously it requires you to kind of get healing soon afterwards or you're really going to pay the price for it but that's 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 a lot on a, on a reusable card 
Yeah, it, it can do a lot of damage. Um, so yeah, to your point, if you already have rejuvenate rejuvenate up, this is the perfect card to play because you can be under rejuvenate, and then the rejuvenate will proc and then um, cleanse both of the wounds and the poisons uh, for you, and it can do a lot of damage. And then the bottom ability is actually. Uh, also a lost card that I'm on board with. A four yeah. attack on the bottom, which is very rare, plus a stun. And, you know, you can, you can do lots of damage with that. It's interesting how how variable the power levels of these cards feel. Like, I wonder how much it feels like the design space of this because they're like, yeah, it has a ton of cards, so we can, you know, get a little bit more wiki-wacky with what we're putting in uh, to the cards uh, as, they, as they're, like, designing the different kinds of, like, melee mode cards. Yeah, I mean, to me, it seems like there are some very, very strong melee cards, and then there are other ones where I'm just like, why would you ever use these? <laughs> and I feel like that's not necessarily the case with other Gloomhaven or other Frosthaven classes. Yeah. And I'm curious, do you agree? Like, I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts on, let's say, like, you know, the Flailing Tendrils top or, like, the Drag Down top, and because, you know, maybe I'm just not using them properly. No, I'm with you. Drag down is one that I would definitely be trying to use a lot because that looks like the kind of thing that I love to do. Is but I, I believe you when you say that you're struggling to to get the formation right. Flailing trend tendrils. I'm I'm really struggling to think of like when I would be using this, and that that bottom is a lost card. Just wound everybody within two spaces is a lost card to me. Seems to like just okay, but then like penalizing your allies as well. Yeah, flailing tendrils is like does not seem great to me. But you know, obviously. Maybe just for the, the, the 12 initiative base move to melee to um, option, I guess, is like a viable choice with that guy. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into the ranged uh, switchers, the one that lets you, you move places. And sorry again for the, the green screen. The uh, the pink cards don't love don't love green screens or red screens, which are the ones that I use. So you, you'll see a couple of the, the elements will look a little goofy here. But yeah, let's start off with Harvest here. Yeah, Harvest uh, the Essence. Uh, so this allows you to ward yourself. And then uh, similar to the other card that we looked on the melee side, it allows you to uh, transition elements uh, into ice or into sun. Uh, and then on the bottom, it allows you to do a move two. And with the move two, you also get a heal two, which can be pretty nice. Yeah. Um, I'd say that I would fairly often play this card because I think that the bottom is only okay. Uh, and if I wanted the ability to be able to kill an element to make sure that the en enemy didn't do anything, uh, the top part was good. And then you just kind of have a side benefit of getting a, a one-time ward on yourself. Yeah, I like a move to heal too. Would you say that you're more likely to play this over the uh, the melee version of this card or vice versa? Well, the me oh, I would play the top of this before I played the melee version, the bottom of the melee card, and the reason for that is that uh, uh, the melee version of the card has two attack twos, and I think two attack twos is way better than a uh, move two heal two. Got it. It's and you you know, yeah, 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 you're giving way too much uh, up on the melee side. Where you know maybe I play this a few times on the bottom, and then I can always play it on the top. But uh, I I never want to give up my uh, two attack twos with the melee form. Got it. Cool. Okay. So probably won't be switching with this very much because it's a lost card. Let's talk about Into My Embrace, which is a card when I looked through these that seemed hilarious. This is my favorite card in the opening set. Uh, and it is a very strong card. Uh, so it does <laughs> a very respectable... <laughs> uh, it does a very respectable three damage uh, at ranged at level one, which is pretty good. But... Um, and then it allows you to switch forms. The bottom ability lets you heal four and rejuvenate with some extra stuff. But in the end, it's mostly just the heal four and the rejuvenate. Uh, but it is a throwaway card, which is the biggest problem. Mm -hmm. um, what, you know, to your point, it's really fun. You're like, okay, well, come into my embrace. I'm going to attack you and just pull you into me. And then you turn into the melee mode and then you can start smacking yeah, them on the next awesome. turn. That's like um, straight up uh, uh, Scorpion from Mortal Kombat, right? Oh yeah, come here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this this is solid. I anticipate that this will probably be part of my kit for a long time. One because it gives you a uh, reusable way to be able to switch forms. Uh, it does three damage. It lets you pull two. It lets you do. It it does everything that you could possibly want in a ranged card. Yeah. Um, note that this is the first card that we've seen with very specific range requirements. Mm -hmm. So that means that um, you have to target 
range three or range four. So even if you have an enemy that's at range two, you cannot use this card uh, for this. And uh, the one thing to note also for this is that if you have any items that increase range, it does not increase uh, the restrictions of the range. And so let's say that you had a, a random item that increased your range, you still can only target at range three and range four. Got it. My inclination, so we just went through um, the Harvest Essence where the bottom is like the move to heal to. My inclination is that move mm -hmm. to and some other effect is probably better on the ranged mode of this class than it is on most character classes because it allows you to set up your attacks. Is that a fair statement? Yes, I would rather have more move though. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> I'd rather have a range, I'd rather have a straight up move three or move four without any benefit. Uh, because in particular, when you're in ranged, if you're in range and you're like, okay, well, I can do it at three or four, but then they move two spaces and then now they're at range two, all your plans are like out the door. Like I, I would definitely prefer more movement as opposed to ancillary benefits on the bottom. Got it. Okay, cool. Let's talk about Mind Spike. Mind Spike. All right, so here we've got another very fast initiative card at 18, and you can basically immobilize three things within range four and five. Note that this is very far away. Uh, <laughs> So this is a pretty big distance, and so I oftentimes found it difficult to do Mind Spike because I'd be in the awkward positions or they'd be too close to me and couldn't do this. Um, but it's a pretty good ability. If you've got some big lumbering enemies, uh, you can keep them at bay and immobilize them, essentially stunning them for a turn. Um, and then you can cause them to lose some damage uh, with plus one if you've got some sun. So. The downside is obviously it is a throwaway. Uh, I would typically not use the top of this unless I had a kind of dire emergency and needed to really keep them at bay for a turn. Yeah. Uh, the bottom ability, however, is fantastic. Um, I really, really enjoy um, using Mind Spike, and you can actually even use Mind Spike in combination with Into My Embrace. You can basically Mind Spike them first and then pull them into you, switch to melee, and so then again, an attack card on the bottom is always good. And so this allows you to um, apply extra DPS um, if you need to burn somebody down. And yeah, 18 initiative is wonderful. Yeah, this basically asks you to be in good position so that you can do a top attack and a bottom attack. Um, but because it's got a low initiative at 18, you could have positioned yourself on the previous turn and then probably gone before the bad guys to make sure you're getting that like double bombard and that's cool. Hopefully, unless you fight wolves and then the wolves just go in front of you and ruin yeah. all of your plans. Know thy enemy or whatever, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, the last of the switchers for the ranged mode is Selfless Offering. Yeah, I think that this is uh, a very all around, it's nothing splashy, but it's a pretty solid card. Uh, so on the top, you can heal three. Uh, to an ally within range three, which is fantastic. Um, again, this one does not have a specific range, so just you know any ally within three. And then uh, if you happen to have fire, then it becomes like ultra good by being able to give uh, somebody rejuvenate. Mm -hmm. uh, so that can allow them to heal um, over multiple turns. But uh, I really like this card for the bottom part, which is move three and then be able to switch forms. Um, uh, just because movement, I think, is a pretty big premium for the Geminid. And so uh, making sure you use any extra pieces of movement is always good. So is this commonly like a um, do a ranged attack and then like charge into melee with the move three switch kind of thing? Or is that too dangerous because now the enemies are aggroing on you? I mean, I guess it depends on your initiative order. Uh, you all, all obviously could always choose to do ranged slower um and i think that in general when i'm in melee i almost always want to go fast and i almost always want to go fast with it when i'm doing ranged but this actually is an example of where you might want to play this in combination with a let's say initiative 70 or initiative 80 ranged card mm -hmm. and use the initiative 80 you ping them then you can run in and then you're ready to play a high initiative melee card on the next round so that you're not getting pummeled by everybody else. Yep, that makes sense to me. Cool. Let's head over to the other um, ranged cards here, I think starting with uh, Firefly Swarm. Yeah, so Firefly Swarm. Um, so top ability allows you to do 3D damage to up to three 
uh, enemies. Uh, the main restriction here is, again, you have to have them exactly at range 4 and range uh, 3, and you can do an extra point of damage. Um, this is a very acceptable throwaway card, in my opinion. Um, it's very similar to uh, the Spell Weaver from Gloomhaven, where you can do damage. Um, the biggest issue sometimes is that there might be something that's two away, uh, and you can't get exactly two. I mean, here, I would definitely aim to get two, uh, would be my baseline. You want to hit two characters yeah. uh, with Firefly Swarm, otherwise it's not worth it to throw away. And on the bottom, you've got to move four, initiative 76. Uh, this is one of the biggest moves that you'll get, and so oftentimes I will also use this to be able to... Uh, catch up with my allies because i think that oftentimes i am further behind totally this is the kind of lost card you want to see right where it's like move four always good for you and then the top is when the situation arises okay now's maybe the time to cash in yeah yeah or if they just happen to be in, in the perfect cluster and then you can like nuke three people then you know definitely yeah. definitely good to be able to throw it away early right get the getting when it's good all right cool hail of thorns Hail of Thorns. Um, yeah, so very, very slow initiative at 88. Uh, you can then attack two for all enemies within two, muddle them, but then the downside is that you're also muddling all of your allies within range two, generate some ice. Bottom ability lets you move three. Um, this is a card that I almost never play. Um, Seems not that exciting. The top ability... You, yeah, the top ability seems good, attack two for everything, but it's not that big of an attack, especially if anything has shields, and then with the downside of muddling all of your allies, and in my games, I also played a lot with the Bone Shaper, so I'm just like, oh gosh, I'm going to muddle like three different allies <laughs> if I play this card, um, and the bottom ability is fine uh, with a move three, but it's also not great. Obviously, if you have some sun that you can use, uh, being able to wound something uh, it's fantastic. The top is also a little goofy because mostly you're attacking things at range three or four, and this one's saying everything within two. And so actually, you kind of almost like want to jump into the middle of the enemies. So sometimes that means sort of like behind enemy lines, and then you're still in ranged mode but not doing this correctly. <laughs> so it seems like your that top somehow wants to be paired with like a bottom that switches into melee mode for the subsequent turn, I guess. Yeah, so I mean, if you did Selfless Offering, you could do that. So you walk in with Selfless Offering, and then you do Hail of Thorns, and then do everything. So so you move three, deal two damage to everyone, and then now you're going to be in melee mode for the next round. But yeah, I don't know. I found that this was just not good enough. Uh, two damage to all is not a... I mean, I can imagine two damage to all would be fine with the downside if it wasn't a throwaway, but it is a throwaway. Right, totally. <laughs> Okay, Scarab Flight here has a, a hilarious line of attacks that you can only do at range 3 or 4. So <laughs> you're hoping the enemies charge at you in formation, I guess? Yes. Uh, <laughs> this one... I've tried to use this a lot, and this one is challenging, again, because you have that exact like 3 by one grid that you can use, and it's difficult to be able to actually hit people in that format. Again, I think that if you can hit 2, you're good, but you're also only attacking them for 2, which is not a ton of damage. Um, the push 1 is nice, but I think that it's just like not in too many restrictions and not enough damage to make it worth it. Uh, the bottom ability here is basically the, the opposite of the extra damage uh, on top of the melee. So that one gets you plus one damage in melee, plus two ranged. Here, what you get to do is that you get to um, have plus one shield when you're in ranged mode or plus two shield when you're in uh, melee mode. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I've actually ever played this. Uh, despite even being a tank, I think that uh, uh, the cost of the card, I'd almost rather have extra... Um, extra cards to throw away um and yeah i don't know if i've actually ever played this on the bottom before yeah yeah i can see that it's also just harder i think with your um ranged mode it seems like the movement matters because you either need to get into position or you're moving so that you can be in melee um, so you kind of need to play it in a specific mode and in general the haven games reward you for being aggressive more than they reward you for being defensive so it, there's a nice mirror design with this and the other card uh, but I can see why the the attack one is just so much better seeming. 
Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, I think that Frosthaven has made it so killing enemies immediately is not as valuable, but still, you attacking people is better than defending, and so um, the other one is just strictly better, in my opinion. Cool. Let's jump over to Smoldering Hatred, which is the from downtown attack. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, in short, I don't like this card. Uh, <laughs> I love the way this card looks. So it's like, okay, you can do two damage to one thing at range four or five. You can just, you can muddle yourself for this attack. And this is before you attack to add plus two damage. Which can be fine. Okay, maybe you want to attack something at four, range four, range five. But then you can also curse yourself and muddle yourself to gain an extra hex. And again, the times where they're exactly in that hex or in side by side and being able to do the damage, I think has not been super great for me. Um, I've carried this in my kit, but I've found that it definitely does not do um, it does not do what I want it to do. Got it. At the, so the muddle yourself thing, you muddle yourself, then have muddle during the attack, and then it lasts through your next turn as well? It's like a, or is it? Yeah. yeah okay. Because anytime, anytime you take a status on your turn, it doesn't expire until the end of your next turn. And yeah. so like, it, it's, it's like two turns of muddle, which is just really, really bad, unless you have a way to cleanse uh, the muddle off of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom here is like a hilarious escape button, I guess. <laughs> like, you guys stay here and I'll run away kind of thing. <laughs> yes uh so you can um immobilize two people within uh that are next to you and then you can basically run away um i might have used this a handful of times but um i i think i often don't carry this in my kit i see so in general uh, oh wait we got one more we got reshape the guys mm -hmm. uh this card is fantastic okay. uh Absolutely fantastic. Um, I think that rejuvenate can be so, so important. Um, so, for example, what you might do is that you might go in and melee, tank a whole bunch of stuff, switch to ranged mode, and then you just reshape the guys and you're able to, you know, maybe get a little bit of loot. But the most important thing is that you throw the rejuvenate on yourself. And now that you're in the back line, you can hopefully basically avoid things and heal, you know, two, three, four, five hit points uh, while you're hitting things at range. And then once you're closer to full life, you can maybe swap and you do a short rest. You can then swap over and then be able to go back into melee mode and take some hits. So I think that rejuvenate in terms of value is just like so good. And being able to have that ability is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then the bottom of this one is also fantastic. And so Interesting. Uh, basically, oh, you, oh yeah. It's just wacky, so, uh, so I don't know how to evaluate it. Yeah, yeah. So um, it says, you know, during a short rest, uh, you can choose which discarded to lose. Um, instead of losing a discarded card at random, and you may switch forms. The first part is actually not the most important part. It's the second part that is absolutely critical because gotcha. sometimes, let's say that you just ran through, you're like on your third, your, your third or fourth cycle of your cards, and you have no more ranged cards, but you're stuck in melee mode. Having this card lets you switch into melee mode without having to do really awkward interactions or having to take a long rest. So you can always switch when you do a long rest. But um, I would say that I almost never long rest with this character. Uh -huh. uh, just because they have so many cards and the tempo, you just want to keep on applying the tempo and moving and moving and moving and moving uh, to be able to do things. And by playing this card, it allows you to be in the correct form that you want to be without losing the tempo of doing a long rest. That makes sense to me. I, the, the characters that have fewer cards you generally do want to be long resting just so you're kind of like keeping pace with the rest of your party um and so this is the opposite right you have so many more cards than your your fellow players that just running through short rests and so improving your short rests in this way um yeah that's clever that makes a lot of sense to me so we are going to dive into the the level up cards so we'll start off course with level two and hung was just telling me that uh, every time you level up, one card is melee and one card is ranged. How do you approach that? Uh, so I've only leveled up to level five so far, but I think I've taken a one of each uh, with each mode. Um, I think that 
given the fact that you're required to carry half of your kit uh, in melee and half of your kit in range, you don't want to skew too far onto one side. And so I've typically been looking at the cards and just trying to find what is uh, the best for my overall build and then kind of go from there. Um, and it just has happened to be kind of one of each. So like melee ranged, melee ranged up to level five. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one that we've got here is uh, Venomous Barbs. Um, this is an amazing card, like mm -hmm. hands down, absolutely amazing. Uh, you have a wonderful initiative at 17 and it's really the bottom ability that makes this card so good. So mm -hmm. attack two poison at the bottom is just so good. And pairing that up with, I think, what was it? Locust Swarm or one of the other ones where you can do two attacks at two, you know, Poison just adds plus one damage for the rest of, I guess not the rest of the game, but until they heal and, uh, you know, at worst case, it prevents uh, them from healing hit points because the poison blocks that. Um, I actually have used the top of this once. Um, so in this particular case, you can get Retaliate 2 within for everything within range 2, or you can disarm yourself and Retaliate 3 for within with re range 3. And if you're at the front and you've got a swarm of things attacking you, you can just absolutely annihilate a lot of those things, especially if you pair this up with like a one or a two shields. You're basically taking zero damage and then doing three damage to everything that's attacking you. Yeah, I can um, see this obviously it is just a handful of like flame demons all at once with you not having to do any work whatsoever. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So conditionally, Venomous Barbs can be amazing. And then the bottom here is just always consistently good. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And then Locust Toast looks really spicy, but my guess is you, uh, I mean, you, my guess is you took Venomous Barbs and you don't have much experience with Locust Toast, but given how you were talking about the like formation of enemies kind of being in these clusters, um, some concerns about maybe being able to trigger that attack in the way that you would want to. Exactly, because it's, it's again, the, the, the if you curse yourself it looks like you can do a lot but how many of those are actually exactly at range two and three right because where you stand getting them to be exactly at range two and range three and only getting two damage on them is just not not, not enough in my opinion and i think that um you know maybe if you were to upgrade it i think i don't remember if diamonds allows you to add an ability or if it's only adding damage to it but um i think that this card unupgraded is just simply much, much, much worse than Venomous Barbs. Totally. Um, bottom ability, what do you get? You get a one movement and you can push two to everything. Um, I think that can be nice to create space. If I were to use this card, I would definitely only use it for the bottom, abil bottom ability. Yep. Um, and, you know, I guess that this does kind of empower your ranged um, ability. And, you know, I was just... Uh, moaning about how nothing could be in range, but being able to push everything to or up to two essentially uh, could be good to get everything within range that you want. But I don't know. I think that Venomous Barbs is just consistently good, whereas Locust Host is much more situational. Yeah, I could totally see that. Okay, so then let's head into level three where we have, I'll try to keep uh, the ranged ones on the left side and the Mandible, the, or the, the Mandible Storm, the uh, melee ones on the right side. So we've got uh, Dragonfly Surge and Mandible Storm at level 3. Yeah, so you've got this weird formation. You can do 3 damage, which is pretty respectable, and immobilize. Uh, but you have to uh, muddle yourself and then switch into ranged form. So you probably want to play this uh, at the start of your turn. Hit everyone, immobilize them, and then run away. Um, for level 3, 3 damage, immobilize, and... Muddling yourself doesn't seem that great to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the bottom ability is move three and shield two. I think that's a very respectable amount of movement and an amount of shield with being able to buff it with ice or with sun. But in general, I don't think it did enough. Um, now, what I do like is the throwaway on the top of Dragonfly Surge. So sure. being able to do a lot of an absolute downtown attack. damage. <laughs> oh my god, you can do so much damage. I mean, I'm thinking this this is similar to uh, one of the ranged attacks of one of the un one of the locked classes in Gloomhaven, being able mm -hmm. to just do a, a one time a throwaway attack and yeah. I think that being able to do that much concentrated damage is just so beneficial. Um and then I think the bottom ability is also fantastic. So if you need to add some pierce you can add pierce to all of your attacks. You have to poison yourself, but no big deal because that means that you can, you know, 
do a whole bunch of extra damage to uh, high shield minions. Um, and there's a decent I would say that I have not... in the background because this is a ranged one with rejuvenate up, so you might be able to to burn off that poison pretty quickly. Yep, yep. And yeah, I think I've only used the bottom ability of this a handful of times. Oh, so, yeah, so um, if it wasn't clear, uh, in my build bar, I picked Venomous Barbs uh, at level 2, and then I picked uh, Dragonfly Surge at level 3. Yeah. Um, yeah, just the top ability is just a very, very, very strong throwaway card. Yeah, I can see that. Cool. Let's go on to level 4. If you're following the pattern of, of melee ranged, melee ranged, you took the melee this level? Uh, I did not actually take the melee at this level. Okay. Um, <laughs> this one, uh, so let's talk about the melee one. Um, Thresh and Flay, a throwaway card, but you can do four damage, three damage, two, two damage, and generate a sun. Uh, obviously, this is amazing. If you're able to poison someone before, then you're just doing a whole oodles and oodles of damage. Um... And then the bottom ability, um, so yeah, initiative 43, bottom ability lets you pull someone towards you, and then you can target other people to get them into melee range. Um, the top ability, I think, I would not ever blame someone for taking this card. I think that the top ability here is very, very good, yeah. uh, because you can just wail down a single enemy with all of that attack. Um, but for me, uh, the reason why I chose this other one was um, I really liked this um, healing ability. So uh, being able to heal four on top, uh, and then being able to target a second ally um, oh, yeah, is really, really, really strong. So it's yeah, so healing eight uh, was really, really good. And uh, with the party composition that I had, uh, it was more important for me to provide support as opposed to melee damage. We had a lot of damage in our party and uh, having this. But I think that, well, let's talk about the bottom card part of the card first. Um, move five jump, fantastic. And then stun two within range one. I think that's also an amazing Very throwaway good. card. Yeah. Like, you can just get into melee range, and then maybe you play something, uh, one of your ranged cards that lets you switch, and then you jump in. Mm. And then you can stun two, and then, you know, have them immobilized. But I definitely think that Thresh and Flail is a totally valid card, and I would have no problems picking this one up. I think Thresh and Flail also, this is one of those cards that depends a lot more on your party composition. Um, I think the, the base classes in Frosthaven pushing and pulling is fine but i will say that there are a number of unlock classes that really like when their friends can push and pull and so it makes a big difference i think in who else is playing in your party at the time that you hit this level yeah um what, one thing i'll note is that you are going to start seeing um the ability to be able to um generate more mana and so here you've kind of got an exchange and in this one, um, on Thresh and Flail, it's on the bottom, and it lets you change a uh, sun into a fire or an ice. And just as a reminder, ice is used on the melee side and fire is used on the range sides. And then on the top of Luminous Descent, it allows you to take a sun, and then it allows you to generate uh, ice or fire. And so here is when you're starting to see a little bit more consistency in terms of element generation. Before, the only way that you could actually generate elements is if you threw cards away or you happen to have somebody who could generate the elements that you wanted from your party. Uh, but here, you can now actually start to kind of self-sustain and you'll see how that comes into play with the level five cards. Okay. Um, did, you have any other, did you have any other questions on this one? No, I'm excited. Comments? I want to hear about the level five cards now. Yes. Okay. So the level five cards, we have uh, Formless Grace, and we've got Chitinous Horde. Um, and so what we'll do is I'll just kind of mention the top and the bottom abilities of Formless Grace and Chitinous Horde. So basically it says, you know, once during your turn, you can suffer two damage to generate a fire or a sun. And notice that this is always the opposite pair. So mm -hmm. when you play the melee mode, it enables the um, the one element that's consistent across it, or the ranged. And then um, the bottom ability here, uh, it's the opposite, where you can um, have an adjacent ally suffer two damage, and then you can generate um, some of those elements. And so this 
starts to give you the ability to have a little bit more self-sustain. You obviously have to take damage to be able to do it, but um, having the elements can really enable you to do bigger things. Um, and you know what? I don't know if I've actually chosen this. I think I leveled up to level five at the end of my last session, and I haven't actually picked my cards. You're, you're mid-deciding. So which one? I'm mid-deciding, so I get to decide on stream or decide on this video what I like. Okay. Anyways, so Formless Grace, you get a one-time ability to heal all allies uh, within range for, or within range one for two. Seems okay. Uh, bottom ability is move four, and then you get to ward yourself. Move four jump is fantastic. Uh, I definitely like that. Uh, Chitinous Horde allows you to grant one ally within three, two shields, and you're able to strengthen yourself. Fantastic initiative at 15. Uh, the ranged ones typically have slightly lower initiative, so having a 15 initiative on the ranged side is fantastic. Uh, and then on the bottom, all adjacent enemies suffer two damage. Once during each turn, you may have an adjacent ally suffer for that. Hmm. I don't know which one I would do here. I think that I would probably lean towards the Formless Grace because I think that the move four jump is like absolutely critical for this to be able to get into the correct positions um in particular with the four person party having the ability to jump gives you so much flexibility to get into the correct position that was kind of my inclination too and if you're able to um i think that that ward is a really cool new ability and pretty sweet for if you can if you can um, eat that ice to to get that on yourself so i'd probably also be choosing formless grace if i was in your position yeah, I think that it's good, and then use it a couple of times as the top ability, or the bottom ability, and then you can always place the other one if you really need to generate those elements to be able to do things or heal a bunch of allies. But yeah, the move four jump is fantastic. Got it. All right, let's get into into unknown territory and take a look at some other things. So, level six. All right, so what do we got here? We've got a Corrosive Acids. Uh, you can do two damage, and you can cause yourself to be brittle and make everyone else brittle. Uh, and then you can cause yourself not to be able to use items. I don't remember what that one's called. And then you can poison things. Uh, remind me quickly on rules. If you were to brittle yourself and you brittle, the brittle would apply on the attack after the attack hits, correct? Uh yeah, so it's like you do the very last thing is brittle and ward. So it's after shields, after poison and stuff like that. So having both poison and brittle is uh is painful. Yeah. Oh, what I, what I meant is um for the attack, uh the attack would apply the brittle and the poison after the damage is applied on the oh, on yes, yes, your yes. Attack. That's right. Yeah, you're setting up for the next person to attack them. Wow, but that's still really really good. Um it's pretty bad that you're putting poison on yourself and not and losing the ability to lose items, but being able to put brittle and poison on up to three enemies, I think that that's pretty dang strong. And you've got a decent initiative. Um, bottom ability is move three. All figures uh, gain minus two shields this round while adjacent to you. That's hilarious. Oh. <laughs> Just like a rude. That could be very good or very bad, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, overall, I think that, that that actually could be good because then you could basically set it up so that all of your enemies, let's say all of those stupid sprites or those demons, uh, you can basically effectively, it's almost like an attack two for every single attack against um, yeah, if they attack multiple times, this this actually is a really really good way to get through high high shield enemies, and all of your allies can attack it without needing pierce themselves. That's that's pretty good. I think this is a very very strong card. But let's see how what I think about it on the other side. Uh, up to two enemies at exactly range two well, or three. Hold so on. Two First damage. of all, this card is oh. called Harudo Therapy, which is just I've never heard those words put together. What's before. Harudo? I don't know, but now I'm excited to learn, right. find out what it is. <laughs> can we can we Google what Harudo is? Yeah, I have no idea what. Uh, we have to know. Harudo. It's a genus of leeches in the family Hirudinidae. So it's a so leech. It's leech therapy. Great. Okay. okay. It's so funny that they didn't call it like leech therapy, but okay. Uh, okay. So what do we got here? Um, up to two enemies at exactly range two or three, suffer two. All right. Can be nice. 
heal self x where x is equal to the number or to the damage that enemy suffered with the damage ability so it's basically just a lifelink lifesteal so if you're able to deal four damage you can heal four damage and then swap forms deal four damage heal four at a level six that's not that good i don't think i like it seems uh, good to me because it's unblockable. Yeah. It's unblockable. I mean, I guess it is. It is also stopper. It's unblockable. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, very, very slow. Uh, you have at the bottom. You have move three. You can deal two damage only at range three and four. And if you immobilize yourself, you can immobilize. If you curse yourself, you can add an extra target. Hmm. Wait, isn't that great though? Because if you mobilize yourself, you're in ranged mode. And then you immobilize the enemy, and they stay at range three to four for your other attacks for a subsequent turn. Yeah, I think that that is good. But oh, the the left side, the corrosive acid seems so good. Both these cards, like being great. able yeah. to. I think for my playstyle, I would definitely lean towards corrosive acids. But it sounds like you might uh, you might consider doing Harudo therapy. Yeah, dude. Just to say that I threw leeches at people for sure. That would be the card that I took. <laughs> <laughs> this is the spike in me where I'm just like, I just want to play the best card, and you're like, no, nope, I, I want to do it for theme. I'm gonna I'm gonna leech you. <laughs> well, maybe the level seven cards will suck, and we could just get both the level six cards, but probably not. So let's take a look at level seven. Yeah, these I think. Yeah, level six, both of them are pretty strong. And to me, what I think that, you know, Isaac and others have done a much better job at balancing the cards because I think that in Gloomhaven, they definitely, I think that there were oftentimes very clear cut builds in yeah. terms of which cards to pick. This one, I definitely would lean towards Corrosive Acids, but I could definitely see why for use for both of them. It depends a little bit also on what you've leveled up in prior levels, I imagine. Because if you just keep leveling up melee stuff over and over again, you're really going to suffer when you're in ranged mode. So I imagine that keeping some kind of balance there is is a part of the, the decision when you're leveling up. Yeah. Yeah. What do we got here? We've got two pronged entrapment. Uh, it's four damage. Okay. And I think that this is... Um, what I was saying before is that uh, we are continuing to see more ways to generate elements, mm -hmm. and we're seeing that uh, on both of these cards. So you can do four damage. Oh, that's interesting. A shield on top. You almost never see a shield on top. Yeah. Uh, you can turn any element into both sun and into cold, which is fantastic. Good attack. Oh, gosh. The bottom ability here is you can push, you can brittle, and you can do a whole bunch of damage to... or. Oh, you don't actually do any damage. You can brittle and target up to four enemies. And if you consume stuff, you can immobilize and disarm. Wow. That image seems really hard to pull off, but the the ceiling of that ability is bananas. If you hit four people with both of the effects on them, you do a lot. You do a lot. You get to disarm them. You get to immobilize them. And then they're pushed and mobilized away from you. And then if you're able to swap forms into melee with your ability or your rest or what, that could be pretty good. Um, yeah, it is very interesting that there you don't actually do any damage with that card, though. So it's just, it's really kind of a setup turn. And I just, no, that's not fair because it's a setup turn and you get to basically. 95% of minions disarming them will basically take them out for that entire round mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah i mean the top of the card uh, right. does so much work so you just wait until the bottom of it is a huge payoff or not and you just keep playing the top version of that card and you're totally good two prong seems great i mean the top version is fantastic i have no problems playing the top card because you get two elements of your choice you can use an ice and then you can even convert the sun into fire or sun into something else with one of your other abilities yeah pretty good all right, let's see the alluring pheromones. Uh, you can winning attack my heart just in terms of the name of its card. It's like this is come on now. <laughs> so you want to use leeches and then use pheromones yeah. to kill people? Yeah, make them <laughs> sexy yeah. pheromones for my leeches. All right, what do we got here? So we can do three damage. 
pull a bunch of people or pull up to two, uh, exactly range four and range five, and you can hit this interesting pattern and do some of that. Hmm. This to me seems only okay. Uh, better at higher player counts, but only doing three damage is so-so. And per but perhaps I'm under-evaluating the pull ability to be able to pull people in. I, it seems to me that the two-prong entrapment top is in general better. Um, and then the bottom ability here, what do we got? We've got heal two, you can rejuvenate and you can bless, which is fantastic. And then if you can consume those elements, you can strengthen yourself and you can bless a second time and deal a whole... Oh, it's not, it's not damage. You heal everyone in that You're range. helping everyone, which is easier to set up than the bottom of the other one, certainly. Um, does this affect yourself? Yeah, that... I think... Not. No, it would not affect yourself because you're the gray tile, yeah. and so you would only be able to. Affect. It's a, it's not re coded that way, but it's effectively only can affect allies. Only allies yeah. um, that's pretty good, and that shape is much, much, much easier to do than the two pronged entrapment. Um, I like the bottom ability of alluring pheromones, but I think that the top of two pronged entrapment is better. I think that the bottom part of alluring pheromones is good enough and is really really strong that i would consider this just for the bottom ability of pheromones alone i what do you probably think? would wind up in a two player i would take out two prong because the odds that i can make alluring pheromones hit multiple targets at range four and five and two player is lower but i think in a four player i i i would lean towards alluring pheromones because there's more allies to hit with the bottom more likely to get multiple enemies that I can hit with the top, which would turn that into an attack six if I can hit even two of them. Um, so I I think this one really depends on the size of your party. Yeah, and I'm thinking about like all of the... If you were to do Bone Shaper with this yeah. and you hit multiple, you could basically add like the entire all of the blessings into deck, the Bone yeah. Shaper's deck because like, like bless two per ally. Let's say they've got a couple of skeletons and one of the big boys, you know, less six yep. <laughs> which could be really really good um yeah i think in my party alluring pheromones would win out yeah hilarious all right level eight both of these all right good, accelerated so. accelerated metabolism so you can either spend fire or ice to strengthen yourself and then you can attack three target two and pierce pretty good especially if you can uh strengthen yourself on your turn which then applies for the next turn uh very slow initiative but you can then also do a move six at the start of your next turn play one card from your hand and immediately perform the top or bottom action of the card then lose this card i think it's really good that seems really good to me right? because it's Especially if you use a lose card, right? I mean, right. the idea is that you play a lose card anyways. And you basically... It's at the start of your next turn. Oh, that's really good. But it looks like there's a symmetrical effect on the opposite side. But yeah, that creates a lot of tempo because you're able to basically just, like, hammer them really hard with your throwaway cards. Right. <laughs> and you, you have this odd circumstance sometimes where you have an odd number of cards for one of your builds, right? So you've got, if you just even in the first lap, right, you have seven, seven. So you're not playing all the cards of one of your builds and this actually allows you to play an additional card. Um, and it's probably true for most of the scenario that one of your hands of cards has an odd number of cards in it. So this playing a third card here seems very good. And as you said, it kind of does the same on the other one here. So it seems pretty spicy. Yeah. That definitely can help you in the cycle. I would say that the value of being able to use a card within a cycle is less important than like the tempo. Like just playing a third card Fair. is just really, really big, especially if it has a has a big impact. Um, but yeah, let's see. Let's take a look at oscillating entity damage four uh, only at range two and three at the start of your next turn. Play one. Okay, basically the same effect as the bottom ability. So move four, do something, or move or sorry, move six and do something, or attack four and do something and then the bottom ability is move four bless yourself and then strengthen which one i'd pick i mean i think that these are both very pickable i lean slightly towards accelerated metabolism yeah the pierce three is really big yeah they both seem they both seem totally fine to me i think i'm inclined to agree but it probably i decide a lot more again based on what i've taken historically yeah 
Cool. Cool. Let's cool. look at the, the number nines to bring us out here. All right. Harbinger of Ruin. On the next four sources of damage from melee attacks targeting you, gain ward, then the attacking enemy suffers five. <laughs> oh, boy. Armor of Agathus from D&D. <laughs> That's that's pretty good. Um, the bottom here is with the ward, pretty, with the ward talk before you take the damage. Um, I think so. I think that's the in, at, at least I read that as the intent. The next one is damage from melee. I think so. That's how I would read it too. So basically, let's say that you're taking a ten point damage attack from a melee attack. You gain ward and you only take five damage, and then the attacking enemy suffers five damage. Um, Although I think that one thing that makes this not as good as I thought is that it's only on the next five, or only the sources of melee attacks, um, which is not, I mean, I think it's still very, very good, but it is definitely not just the next sources of melee or ranged attacks from you. Yeah. But the bottom of this card also strikes me as just very cool. It's a lot of damage there yeah. on a bottom attack. Yeah. Um, attack four, immobilize, and then retaliate two. Retaliate two is big. Yeah, that that's very, very good. Okay. Uh, one thing to note also with Harbinger is that it's got fantastic initiative at 11. Oh. Uh, Voice of Salvation. All, all allies within three add plus two to all of their attacks and all enemies within range three add minus one to their attacks this round. Oh, my God. That that could just change the entire game right there. Hmm. Uh, in particular, if you have a lot of you know bone shaper with a bunch of allies or you have people with multiple you know aoe attacks adding plus two to all of them and it's not even a throwaway like right. wow um that seems good and then the next one is on the next four cards allies would lose to negate damage they instead do not lose the card Oh, wow. Like, if you're looking for, like, a long, sustained campaign and you need to support characters, like, that can really keep all of your allies alive. Yeah. I mean, I think that both of them are good. I think that the voice of salvation could be a complete game changer and that the top part of that ability alone would want me to keep that. I, again, think the the party comp makes a huge difference here. If you're playing a four-player game, if you're playing with allies that have summons, Voice of Salvation is just nutters. If you're playing a two- or three-player game and you're not playing summon-heavy classes, um, I think Harbinger of Ruin just does so much that I probably does would be able to grab that. That's true. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about, like, you know, I guess I have three times the number of allies just in player characters yep. in my game, right? Yes, it's like, and that, you know, me being able to buff plus two to three different things, and that doesn't even include summons is so big. But when you just play with Aaron, if you don't have a summoner class, Voice of Salvation can be almost a dud. Yeah. Uh, so actually, let's talk Masteries first real quick. Uh, yeah. uh, I've done one of the Masteries, which was lose at least one ability card each round. This includes <laughs> uh, playing permanent <laughs> abilities or tossing cards away, that one's actually pretty easy to hit, uh, <laughs> as long as you're taking damage. Um, and then switch forms each round. I've tried a few times, but I would say that uh, I am the person in my party that is most reluctant to try uh, to go for um, battle goals at all costs, uh, and some members of my party, names will not be said, uh, <laughs> typically <laughs> uh, go gung-ho for that, and it means that I'm oftentimes uh, doing other things to make sure that we don't lose. <laughs> um, so, switching forms each round, it definitely can be done, but I think that that's, uh, that's a more challenging one. Um, when I play, I typically like to do um, lower variance and so i think the the first four ones that i've taken were the top four basically so removing the minus twos mm -hmm. and then i also really like the ability to be able to remove the minus ones but uh to be able to change any element into any element is fantastic so being able to generate your own sun being able to generate your own fire or ice which is great um i also picked the add two plus ones and then push so that we can get things out of the way mm -hmm. and also did the whenever you short rush, you may remove one negative condition from an ally within range three. Um, I think that overall, the only ones that I don't know if I would pick are the brittle self and then the no, 
I think that all of these have valid uses. Um, but I think that with the Geminit, uh, it can be challenging because I think that even though I've removed all of those, I still have negatives in my deck because mm -hmm. I think it's one negative two and then what, five or six negative ones in, in the base deck. Um, let's see, there's 20 cards and six are negative. So there's five negative ones. Yeah, so I still have two negative ones inside of my deck. And so I haven't been able to remove all of them, whereas other classes you can remove all of your negatives. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any strong one. I think that the ones that have been most useful are the make any element into another element. And that kind of gives you a little bit of a support ability, whether to support yourself or to support other allies who need to um, who need elements to be able to uh, buff up their cards. What do you think about the weird text ones at the bottom, like the the double, uh, the performing uh, a lost icon? You can pick up a card from your discard pile. Um, well, so it's not you get to pick up a card. You have to discard a card to pick up a card. And so it allows you to play um, a cycle. So basically, it's the same tempo. Like you don't. It's not like a stamina potion. Yeah. Uh, you basically are allowed to play another card, and that could be very good if you have a strong card that you don't want to wait for the next cycle to be able to play again. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's worth the two check marks compared to everything else, but you know, maybe it could be better once I get stronger cards. I guess I only just hit level five and. Well, but you have to discard one at a higher level, so mm, I don't know. That, that just seems like too much of a cost yeah. to be able to be in the tempo. I mean, I don't know if there are stamina potions in uh, Frosthaven. We haven't seen any yet. Uh, but uh, it seems like if you have the ability to use a stamina potion, like it would be much, much better than that. But maybe they're not, and this is the only way to get something back. Yeah, cool. Right on. Uh, well, Hung, thank you so much for for teaching me about the Geminates. Uh, are you are you feeling like you're excited to play this class for a lot more scenarios, or are you eager to to play some of the uh, the secret unlocks that you found along the way? Where are you, where are you sitting at now? That you're at level five. I'm at three out of four, or three out of five on my personal quest progress. Uh, so getting there. Uh, I think we've played like what 15 games. So hopefully, I'll be able to get my last two tick marks uh, to be able to change classes. I'm definitely looking forward to do a different class, but you know, I think I've had a lot of fun. This one has definitely hurt my brain the most to be able to try to, uh, to be able to have the right cards in hand, to be able to have the right positioning and be in the right you know spots to be able to hit them with my very range specific cards. And um, I definitely think that I want a lower complexity character and a little more chill character for my next one. Yeah. Yeah, right on. I mean, even the low complexity characters have their fun niches. I played a complexity character yeah. too that I thought had a really fun play pattern with great decisions. So whether they, whether it was complex rules wise or not, did not mean that the decision space was any weaker. Um, so I've, I'm, I've, I'm definitely enjoying the Frosthaven designs. But thank you for walking us through the Geminate. That was so helpful. Really appreciate it.